A pilot becomes the first man in Connecticut to be found guilty of murder despite the lack of a body. Our moment in crime is the murder of Hella Crafts. Investigators stood on the banks of Lake Zor, an area of the Housatonic River in Newtown, Connecticut. They were following up on a lead from a man called Joseph Hine as part of their investigation surrounding the disappearance of a 39-year-old woman called Hella Crafts. On the night of the 18th of November, 1986, a severe storm hit the area. The power went out and snow and ice covered the roads. On the night of the 20th of November, Joseph Hine had set out into the cold in a snowplough to clear the roads, part of his job as a utility worker. While Joseph carried out his task, he was witness to something rather strange. Close to Lake Zor, Joseph noticed a U-Haul style van with a large wood chipper attached to the back. As Joseph passed by, he noticed a man standing near the truck. Joseph continued with his work and eventually passed through the same area again, but in the opposite direction. This time the scene was different. The man was gone, but the wood chipper had been used, as wood chips were strewn about the shoulder of the road. Although he thought it was odd that someone would be using a wood chipper in the middle of a storm, he didn't give the encounter a second thought. Over a month later, residents of the area were becoming increasingly angry at the lack of an investigation into Hella Craft's disappearance. After Joseph Hine got in touch with the police to report what he had seen, the authorities headed out to Lake Zor. They found what they expected to, wood chips. But in amongst the wood chips was something else. Along with pieces of fabric and green plastic were small pieces of bone and strands of blonde hair. A piece of a letter with the missing woman's name and address on it alarmed the police. The tip from Joseph Hine had led investigators to a crime scene and the location of Hella Crafts. Hella Crafts was born Hella Lork Nielsen in Denmark in July 1947. She was an only child and her happy nature brought about lots of friendships with other children. Hella seemed to be the only child at school who enjoyed learning and began to show a talent for languages in her teens. By the time she reached adulthood, Hella had learned French, English, German, Norwegian and Swedish. Her desire to earn a degree led her to England, and after graduating she headed to France, where she found work as an au pair. It was while Hella was in France that she found a job as an air stewardess with Capital Airways, flying to Africa regularly from Brussels or Frankfurt. Hella successfully applied for a job with Pan Am Airways, and was sent to Miami for training. Hella was a natural at her job, finishing first in the class. On the 24th of May 1969, Hella was waiting at a motel for a flight when she met Richard Crafts. Richard was born on the 20th of December 1937 in New York City. 
He had two older sisters, and his father's success as a businessman meant that his children could grow up in the affluent community of Darien, Connecticut. Richard dropped out of college and joined the Marines in 1956. In the Marines, he flew helicopters and trained on fixed-wing aircraft, eventually becoming a certified pilot in the late 1950s. Richard flew missions in Southeast Asia and returned to the USA in 1966. In 1968, he found a job as a pilot with Eastern and he became known for dating stewardesses exclusively. When Richard met Helle in 1969, he was already engaged. A relationship started anyway, but Richard continued to see other women. The couple constantly took breaks and they were known to argue, sometimes in public. Hella knew that her friends didn't like her boyfriend. They told her what they thought of Richard. But in 1975, Hella became pregnant with Richard's child and the couple married in November that year. This led to the purchase of a one-storey ranch home in Newtown, Connecticut, where the couple's three children, Andrew, Thomas and Christina, would be raised. When Hella returned to work after having her children, Dawn Marie Thomas, 19, was hired as an au pair. The marriage brought out Richard's controlling nature. The couple was well off. Their combined salary of $125,000 a year placed them in the top 5% of wage earners in the US in the 1980s. But Richard was in control of the couple's earnings. He ordered Helle to take care of the necessities like food and the bills while he spent money on whatever he fancied. Richard spent a lot of money collecting guns. He would also spend money on machinery. His front lawn was where he housed his collection that included a backhoe worth $25,000. In 1982, Richard became a volunteer police officer in Newtown. It seemed that the little power he had went straight to his head. He would hang around the police station when he wasn't on duty and responded to calls when he wasn't authorised to do so. Four years later, he was hired as a police officer in nearby Southbury. Richard paid for training sessions and he bought a 1985 Ford Crown Victoria, the same type of car the Connecticut State Police used, that he outfitted with antennas, a radio, lights and a siren. But by the summer of 1986, Hella knew that she wanted to end her marriage. Richard had continued to see other women after they married, something private investigator Keith Mayo confirmed after Hella hired him. This added to the fact that Richard had become physically abusive caused Hella to hire a divorce attorney. Hella had had enough. By the 1st of December 1986, Keith Mayo was sure that something was wrong. According to his information, Hella left her home at 5 Newfield Lane to drive to Richard's sister's home in Westport on the 19th of November. Hella never appeared at her destination and no one had heard from her since. Mayo called the Newtown police to report Hella missing and added that she might have been murdered by her husband. Hella's car was later found in a Pan Am Airlines employee parking lot at Kennedy Airport. 
Richard said he hadn't seen Hella since the 19th of November. He said they had both slept at home the night before she vanished. Hella was happy and made no indication that something was wrong. According to Richard, Hella had decided to go to her sister-in-law's house because of the fierce storm in the area. Hella's friends were worried. The Hella they knew would never intentionally leave her children. Her friends reported to the police that Richard had had several affairs and that Hella had recently started talking about divorcing him. But the police didn't make Hella's disappearance a priority. Richard's explanation seemed to satisfy them, no matter how many times it varied. Sometimes he said he didn't know where Hella had gone. Other times he'd said she'd gone to Germany and would return soon. Then he'd said that Hella's mother Elizabeth had become ill and Hella had flown to Denmark to be with her. Hella would be back on the 24th of November. That date soon passed by and there was still no sign of Hella. One of her friends, Lena Johansson, convinced Richard to give her Elizabeth's phone number. Lena made the call and found that Elizabeth was in good health. But what Lena was told next was alarming. Hella wasn't with her mother and Elizabeth wasn't expecting to see her daughter until April 1987. Lena contacted the police to pass on the information she'd gathered, with some of the last words that Hella had said to her in the back of her mind. If anything happens to me, don't assume it was an accident. The couple's au pair, Dom Marie Thomas, was understandably worried about Hella. When she spoke to the police, she revealed that nothing about the 19th of November seemed right. Dawn was woken by Richard at 6am that day. Hella, Richard said, had decided to drive to his sister's house in Westport as the storm had caused a power outage in Newtown. Dawn wondered why anyone would want to drive during a storm. Richard went on to say that he would be taking his children and Dawn to his sister's where they would meet Hella. Dawn helped Richard to wake the children and they headed to Westport in Richard's car. When they arrived at his sister's house, Richard didn't stay long. After dropping Dawn and the children off, he left. Richard came back at 7pm to take Dawn and the children home. As they left Westport, Hella was on Dawn's mind. She had never arrived at her sister-in-law's. Curious as to Hella's whereabouts, Dawn questioned Richard. He had no idea where Hella was. When Dawn asked about Hella again the next day, she was told that Hella had travelled to Denmark because her mother was ill. This seemed like a plausible explanation. But then Dawn noticed that parts of the carpet in the master bedroom had been cut out and were missing. Kerosene, Richard said, had been spilt on the carpet and it needed replacing. Acting on this new information, the police asked Richard to take a lie detector test on the 4th of December. He complied and passed. An investigator concluded in his report that because Richard had passed the test, and because of things Richard had told the police, Richard had no clue where his wife was. Richard wouldn't be questioned again until the 11th of December. While working the night shift at the Southbury Police Station, detectives in Newtown asked him to come in for an interview. It was noted that Richard seemed guarded during the interview 
and his answers to questions seem to have been carefully crafted. After giving detectives a one-page statement, Richard was released. Hella's disappearance was discussed for the first time in the press when the Danbury News Times published an article about her on the 17th of December. By now, it was beginning to look like the Newtown police was neglecting Hella's case. This, coupled with Hella's friend's non-stop campaign of calling the police for updates, caused the state attorney's office to hand the case over to the state police. It now felt like a proper investigation into Hella's disappearance was taking place. The Western District Major Crimes Unit looked into Richard's activities in the run-up to Hella's disappearance. Richard's credit card bill showed purchases that would lead to a search warrant for his home being issued. On the 13th of November, Richard bought a large Westinghouse freezer at an appliance store in Danbury. The freezer cost $375 and Richard collected it on the 19th of November, the day Heller went missing. But the most alarming purchase happened at Darien Rentals, a purchase that cost $900. Richard had rented a brush bandit wood chipper. On Christmas Day, the authorities entered the Crafts family home through a back window. No one was home. Richard had taken his children to Florida for the holidays. The home was a complete mess. Furniture had been wrecked. Clothes had been flung about, dirty dishes and utensils littered the kitchen, boxes had been stuffed full of toys, mattresses lay on the living room floor and the carpets had been removed. 108 pieces of evidence were seized, including weapons, towels, fibre samples and a king-sized mattress. Dr Henry C. Lee of the State Police Laboratory went to the house to carry out luminal testing. Various areas of the house tested positive for the presence of blood, as did some of the towels collected as evidence. The blood type was determined to be O positive, the same as Heller's. With the small pieces of human remains found in amongst the wood chips on the banks of Lake Zor, investigators began searching the river. It was far too cold for divers to remain in the water for long periods of time, so permission was granted to lower the water level by restricting the flow at the power dam upriver. The search lasted weeks and would only implicate Richard in the disappearance of his wife even more. One of the first pieces of evidence found was a piece of a human toe. Dr Henry C. Lee oversaw the collection of evidence during the search. At trial he would discuss exactly how many pieces of human remains were found in Lake Zor. Dr Lee said, Our team's efforts at Lake Zor eventually led to the discovery of 2,600 strands of blonde hair, 69 slivers of human bone, 5 droplets of human blood, 2 teeth, a truncated piece of human skull, 3 ounces of human tissue, a portion of human finger, one fingernail and one portion of toenail. Also found in the river was a chainsaw. In the chainsaw's teeth was human tissue, blonde hair and blue fibres. The blue fibres matched the carpet in the craft's master bedroom. The serial number on the chainsaw had been filed off but the forensics lab managed to restore it. 
The receipt detailing the purchase of the chainsaw was found in amongst some personal papers belonging to Richard that Hella had given to private detective Keith Mayo. It was beginning to come clear exactly what had happened to Hella and that Richard was the one responsible. The police came up with the following scenario regarding how Richard killed Hella. Drops of Hella's blood was found in her bedroom, leading to the assumption that Hella was bludgeoned by Richard in the master bedroom early on the morning of the 19th of November. Richard then carried Hella to the basement where the new freezer was. After placing his wife in the freezer, Richard drove Dawn and the children to his sister's house, mentioning that Hella would meet them there. He dropped off Dawn and the children and returned home. He removed Hella's frozen body from the freezer and took it to a secluded property he owned. There, Richard used the chainsaw to cut up his wife's body, which he wrapped in plastic bags and returned to the freezer. In the middle of the night, Richard took the packages to Lake Zor, where he ran them through the wood chipper. What Richard didn't realise was that some pieces of Hella, including mail she'd put in her pocket, fell on the ground and not in the river. When it became clear what had happened to Hella, one resident of Newtown commented that the whole thing was like something out of Edgar Allan Poe. Richard seemed to believe that without a body, the law wouldn't be able to touch him. When speaking to his brother-in-law after divers began searching for Hella, Richard said, Let them dive, there's no body. It's gone. But justice came calling for Richard on the 11th of January, 1987. Connecticut state troopers and detectives headed to his home at 9pm to arrest him. When he received a call from the authorities, Richard said, I'm tired, I'll take care of it in the morning. Richard finally handed himself over to the police at 12.30am. His bail was set at $750,000. Due to the publicity surrounding the case, the trial was moved to New London, Connecticut. Dr Henry C. Lee testified, as did two forensic odontologists who confirmed that two pieces of human teeth found in the river belonged to Hella. 100 witnesses testified, 650 exhibits were presented and the trial lasted 53 days. The case went to the jury on the 23rd of June 1988. Nine men and three women tried to reach a verdict over the next two weeks. The majority of the jury wanted a guilty verdict. One juror, however, wanted a not guilty verdict. He was convinced that Richard was innocent and was sure that he had seen Hella driving a car. The juror ended up walking out of the deliberations and he couldn't be persuaded to continue. On the 15th of July, 1988, a mistrial was declared. The second trial began on the 7th of September, 1989, and the venue was changed again, this time to Norwalk, Connecticut. The jury of 11 men and one woman began to deliberate on the 20th of November. It took the jury eight hours to reach a unanimous verdict. Richard Crafts showed no emotion as he was found guilty of the murder of his wife. He was sentenced to serve 50 years in state prison. Richard's appeal for a new trial was dismissed in 1993. 
he will not be eligible for parole until 2022. Karen Rogers, Richard's sister, was given custody of Hella's children. Richard has said that he has wrongly been portrayed as a cold-blooded killer. But Richard will have to live with the consequences of his actions. He became the first person in the state of Connecticut to be convicted of murder without the presence of a body.